I'm sitting here with Doug Porpora. Doug is a well-known critical realist and has been in critical realist circles for, for some time. And I thought I'd take this opportunity to ask him a couple of questions. Um, the first one I have for you, Doug, uh, how did you come to critical realism? Well, it's an interesting story. I was adopted by the critical realists, essentially. So back in like 19, late 1980s, um, I wrote a critique. Uh, in the 1980s um, was a time when um, sociological holism was actually quite dominant. So it didn't go by that name. It went by the name of pure sociology. Sociologists were also always trying to distinguish themselves from psychologists. And so they wanted to um, have explanations that just involve social facts, like Durkheim said, um, explain social facts only in terms of other social facts and not in terms of individuals. So for Durkheim, using Durkheim for an example, you know, he has, um, as the size of a society increases, uh, the differentiation within it increases. Or as social cohesion decreases, the suicide rate goes up. And these are just relations, uh, if-then relations, among social facts. And if that's your idea of an explanation, uh, you don't have any individuals in them. And uh, it's amazing how many sociologists but yes, we've done it. We, we, we've, we've accomplished Durkheim's dream. So I, I wrote a paper at that time saying, well, you really only have an explanation if you're really trying to follow the covering law um, uh, model of causality, uh, of causal explanation, which uh, depicts causal explanation as a deductive explanation. Uh, your covering law has got to be deterministic. Well, nobody in, in sociology thinks that we have deterministic laws. They say, well, we're we looking for statistical laws. Well, that's kind of a dodge, too, because if you, for the covering law model to work, you at least need something to be invariant, an invariant probability. So if social cohesion goes up so much, then there's um, 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 point something uh, invariant probability that uh, the suicide rate is going to go up. But we don't have that either. All we have is what are called caterus paribus um, explanations. And what I said was, um, which is caterus paribus, uh, I'm not going to go into it, but they don't work at all in the covering one model. So you really got nothing. If you really want to connect social cohesion to the suicide rate or the division of labor to, um, um, or increases in the size of a social system to the division of labor, then you really have to say, um, you have to say, let's take uh, the suicide rate. Social cohesion affects individuals in some way. And individuals so affected are likely to react in a certain way, which increases the suicide rate. Well, so in addition to relations among social facts, you've now got social psychological relations, relations between social cohesion and individuals, and actually a psychological explanation between individuals so affected and their actions, and then those actions and the suicide rate. So the covering law model will only work if uh, relations among um, individuals are deterministic. And then I, I did a kind of argument that they're not deterministic. And so this, you cannot have a, um, you're not going to be able to keep individuals out of your account. So I sent this into some journal that I had heard of and was directed to that would be sympathetic to this argument called Journal for the Theory of Social Behavior. Well, they loved this. And they said, well, we want to devote a whole issue to this. And they got Blau and Mayhew and Jonathan Turner to write responses to me, along with somebody who was something called a critical realist. And they, they were also said to me, you know, you should really read uh, Roy Baskar and Ram Hare and um, Madden. And uh, they're uh, Ron. Hare and Madden's book, Causal Powers, Possibility of Naturalism and Realist Theory of, Realist Theory of Science. So I read these things in between the time when people were writing their critiques of me. I said, oh my god, I guess I'm a critical realist. Uh, and I started, by the time the responses came in, I, started, I was talking like a critical realist. So all of a sudden, it looked like I'd been a critical realist all along. So what they were arguing is, first of all, against the covering law model of causality, and was offering this uh, model of causality that really causality is about causal powers, the, um, the, um, 
they were talking about what's the mechanism that makes, if you think in terms of so, the way sociologists talk, in terms of independent variables and dependent variables, well, what's the mechanism through which the independent variable affects and has this effect that causes the dependent variable to be what it is? And um, that's not any kind of a deterministic relation. And uh, in an open system, these mechanisms, multiple mechanisms are operating, what we would call today conjunctures of mechanisms, and they're interfering with each other. So that really, you have to tell a narrative if you want to see how these all, how these all affect pre people who themselves are a kind of a causal mechanism that act in, um, you know, exercise something we call free will. And, and how, how do they interact? I mean, they don't just act randomly, they act through reasons, but it's not deterministic. So that seemed to me to really solve um, the problem. Um, and that was the beginning. So Doug, just to build on that, uh, why do we actually need theory? Why can't we just do the work? In my book, uh, Reconstructing Sociology, I actually use an example. I use Durkheim again. So let's just take the example of Durkheim, because I think it's a really apt example. So Durkheim um, doesn't want to do psychology. Um, let's talk about Durkheim of suicide. And so Durkheim argues, and this is really uh, the Durkheimian argument here, you see it repeated in C. Wright Mills, you see it in the, the most recent debate o over methodology. They really don't want to deal, deal with people's intentions. Durkheim says, well, you can't measure intentions. Uh, we, we, we don't know what people's intentions are. Um, so that's the same argument we've, ju we've just heard. You can't tell what people's intentions are. Um, and um, it's really irrelevant um, because all, what, all that really matters is intentions don't cause your behavior. So you can't tell what they are and intentions don't cause your behavior. Well, the first argument is, is kind of uh, a non-starter because um, if they do cause your behavior, then um, you better find them. You can't say, well, we're going to ignore them. Um, and the second argument uh, I'm not going to go into, but it, it, it seems preposterous to say that intentions don't cause our behavior. We can only understand each other if um, I assume that, if you assume that um, what I'm communicating to you right now, the words I'm communicating to you, um, I'm communicating those words to you because I intend to communicate what I'm communicating to you. If, if, if I don't know why I'm saying what I'm saying, then you have no reason to accept what I'm saying as what it seems to be saying. Um, so I think that, um, and I think that. Uh, the other argument I make is that our ability to know each other's, uh, generally, we don't always know each other's intentions, but at the surface level, um, human beings have uh, always survived by coordinated action. And I think coordinated action would be impossible if I tell you, look, you're going to stand in front of that mastodon and I'm going to come around and uh, shoot it from behind. Well, we have to assume that we each know what we're going to do to uh, accomplish this task. If we don't know, if we're so like, um, governed by unknowable motives, nothing could ever get done. So what Bhaskar would call a transcendental argument, I'm making a transcendental argument here, one of the possibilities, um, one of the conditions of possibility for a coordinated action is that we have a pretty good idea of what each other's intentions are most of the time. Well, so in any event, Durkheim, uh, this is still to answer your question, why do we need theory? Well, so Durkheim says, <clears throat> We're not going to define uh, suicide in terms of intentionality. It's just in terms of knowledge. Well, um, first of all, that's not what most people mean by suicide, um, just knowing you're going to die. Um, so really what Durkheim is having a study is no longer suicide, but some, some other creature that he's created, which uh, in my book I call Durkicide. He's studying Durkicide, not suicide, and he's telling us all about Durkicide. And at the end of the day, whatever statistics he collects is not going to tell us about suicide. It's going to be some melange of intended and unintended behaviors that he's collected under this new category. So you might as well call it Durkheim. Well, so uh, fortunately, Durkheim makes an important error. I mean, he makes a couple of errors. One, I think, is this uh, error of uh, eliminating intentionality. But he makes a second error that corrects for it. And the second error that corrects for it is he bases his um, analysis on official statistics. Well, if you're basing your analysis on official statistics, they're really counting suicide, not Durkicide. So whatever he said um, 
um, in terms of theory. In his methodology, he made the mistake in how he operationalized, which actually corrected for it. Now, had he not made that second mistake, I would argue that all his empirical labor was for naught, because it was telling us about some ridiculous concept called Durkheim. So I think that um, you need to ask fundamental questions. To avoid that mistake, you need to ask fundamental questions that actually go beyond um, sociology, that go beyond empirical, empiricist sociology. You have to ask questions, well, how do persons behave? What's the best? Uh, you know, you don't want to talk about psychology, but I'm sorry, you have to talk about individuals, and you can't. Um, you're going to have to uh, um, base your analysis on the best account we have on how individuals behave, and the best account we have is that they're purpose of actors that um, act for reasons that they generally know, and that other people can, on the surface at least. Determine. Sociologists do not like this, as I say, they do not like it to, the, to this day, because there's still a very strong um, stream of sociologism, uh, which is to cut sociology off as an independent discipline from psychology. One final question, Doug. What would the ideal sociology look like? In an ideal world, uh, from my perspective, if critical realism were to become dominant, um, sociology would operate very differently. For one thing, um, it would unify all methods. We would understand that um, there's a place for ethnography, there's a place for um, statistical analysis, uh, there's a place for, uh, certainly a place for in-depth interviews, which I do myself, um, textual analysis, content analysis. Um, so we would see, we, none of these would be privileged. They'd all represent different, um, um, they'd all reflect different phases of the research process. But more fundamentally than that, we would be more philosophically reflective about what we do. And a lot more of what we would do would not be collecting data, but thinking about and arguing about what we do. Right now, American sociologists, um, um, think that uh, conceptual debate holds them up from um, um, gathering data and testing hypotheses. Well, they should be held up. There's a lot of conceptual work that needs to be done. Um, work about um, um, what it is to be a person, uh, whether or not, uh, you know, as Chris Smith says in his book, uh, What is a Person, we really shouldn't be proposing and acting on models of ourselves that we don't live by, that we couldn't live by, that are, that are really self-alienated from ourselves. Unless we think that we're some kind of species above human beings that act a certain way and the human beings don't. I mean, if that's what we're doing, it's what Giddens called the derogation of the lay actor, and, and it's rampant. Um, it's rampant in positivism, it's rampant in postmodernism, it's rampant in a lot of what we do. Um, um, I can make this really short, though. What would we look like? We would look like um, British sociology. In an ideal world, we look like, the ideal sociology would look like British sociology before it became more Americanized. Thanks for your time, Doug. It's been very illuminating. Thanks, Tim. It's been fun.